Good morning, everyone. Psalm 84.10 says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. We may not physically be together in this church, but we are still in the presence of our Lord. In CYF, we have been discussing about what worship is. And for the past Fridays, we were reminded that worship is a proper response to God's revelation. It's not about the place where we meet, nor the religion that we have. In John 4, 23, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit is to respond to Him with our hearts through love and obedience, and to worship God in truth is to know Him with our heads through studying His Word. So today, wherever we are, whether we are together in this church or at home, we can truly worship Him in spirit and in truth. The psalmist said in one, one, Psalm 134, Praise the Lord, you servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord, He who is the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord we worship is the maker of heaven and earth who desires a loving relationship with us. When we look at the grandness of His creation, we can just probably wonder, like David who wrote in Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set the glory in the heavens. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. What more can, we, can our hearts desire? Who else can take his rightful place in our hearts? May we desire to worship him more than anything else in this world.
Good morning. Yeah, it is good to see all of you here today, and I hope you and your family are doing well. We probably wish that the life of Christians will always be smooth. Everyone is physically healthy, and everyone is financially wealthy. I mean, how many of you do not want to be physically healthy, especially now that COVID is widespread? The, mom, the count has reached, I think, 50 million, right? And how many of you do not desire to have more money. Let's be honest. Many of us probably have enough for our basic needs plus some luxuries. But if God offers us more wealth, will you want it? Huh? I, I think, yes, uh, we, we, we all want to be blessed. And yes, wealth is God's blessing. We need to recognize that. And we thank God for His blessings. We see godly people in Scripture who were wealthy. Abraham, the father of faith, was wealthy. Job, described by God himself as blameless and upright, was the richest in his land. And King David, a man after God's own heart, was also wealthy. In fact, some preachers emphasize that good health and material blessings prove 
that you are obeying God. Okay? But this is not true. Okay? I have two questions. Do you know of anyone who obeys God faithfully but is not financially rich? Right? You think of missionaries serving God in slum areas. They obey God faithfully but may not be financially rich. And do you know of anyone who does not obey God, who cheats, who is dishonest, but is financially rich? You also know that, right? Think of officials embroiled in scandals that you read about in newspapers. How we wish that the godly will always be wealthy, the wicked will always be poor. That makes life a lot easier. But reality is, this is not always the case. There are godly people who are poor, and there are wicked people who grow rich. And even the psalmist reflected on this when he says, Why should I fear when wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? Okay? What we will do this morning is to reflect on this question the psalmist raised and specifically reflect on the limitations of wealth. Why don't we all rise to read Psalm 49? Psalm 49, together. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With a harp, I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me? those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless all perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations. Though they had named lands after themselves, people, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers, who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases. For they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them. Though while they live, they count themselves blessed. And people praise you when you prosper. They will join those who have gone before them who will never again see the light of life. People who have wealth but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. Shall we pray? Please pray for yourselves. Pray for me as well. Father, we come before you. We pray, Father, that you use your word to just help us see things from your eyes. We may see things that's difficult to accept in this world, yet help us to see things from an eternal perspective. Teach us, speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. How do you feel when you hear of kidnappers and corrupt government officials and dishonest people and thieves getting rich? Uh, Psalms usually are records of praise or petition. Psalms 49, however, is what we call wisdom psalm. It is more like the first few chapters of Proverbs in literary style. It teaches people how to conduct themselves. So that's why we see in verse 1, Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world. Whether you're Jewish or Filipino or Chinese or Korean or Indian or American, This applies to you, both low and high, rich and poor alike. Whether you have high status or low status, 
whether you are an executive or are jobless, whether you earn millions or you are in debt, this is for all of us. Verse 3 says, My mouth will speak words of wisdom. Of medi of, uh, the meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp, I will expound my riddle. The psalmist wants to teach us how to face something that's puzzling many of us, which is, why are there wicked people who get rich? Does the same question bother you? When we hear of kidnappers receiving millions from innocent victims, when we see big businessmen exploiting employees with less than minimum wage, when we read of the 15 billion peso field health fraud, how do we feel? Are you bothered when the wicked get rich and seem to get away with it? Just imagine the scale of the field health scandal. Okay? If a minimum wage earner, probably earning 10,000 pesos a month, okay, saves his entire salary every month without spending anything, do you know how many years it will take for him to be able to save 15 billion pesos? It will take a minimum wage earner 125,000 years of never spending anything to be able to accumulate 15 billion pesos. That's around 3,000 lifetimes before he could earn 15 billion pesos. Now, if you're the honest employee working so hard and you read about this scandal, how would you feel? Wouldn't you be disturbed? And when the psalmist wrote Psalm 49, he was probably faced with evildoers who were getting rich and even threatening his life. Maybe he felt it was not worth it for him. He feels like, I live a righteous life. I'm honest. I work hard. But I can only earn this much. This evil man, on the other hand, keeps earning more and more. He deceives people. He's wicked. And he even threatens my life. And so the psalmist writes his reflections and in the process describes the limitation of wealth. And first limitation of wealth is wealth cannot stop us from dying. Can you say that with me? Wealth cannot stop us from dying. Verse 5 says, Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? No one can redeem the life of another and give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. Some people spend their whole life earning and earning and earning. They forget they will, there will be an end to life. And wealth cannot stop us from dying. The psalmist makes it clear the ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. We may buy vitamins and perhaps that may help prolong our life for a few years. We may invest in treadmills and gym memberships, and that too may help, provided you use your treadmills. Sometimes gym equipments end up as sampayan or pampatong ng boxes at home. We can even spend for stem cell therapy and perhaps live to be as old as Enrile and Imelda. Money can also be used to pay the best doctors, and every time we get sick, we can undergo treatment immediately. But even that has limits. Wealth cannot stop us from dying. I remember the last time my mom was in the hospital. Uh, she, she had colon cancer, metastasized to lung, to liver, and then I think went back to colon. And she had undergone several surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy. So we asked the doctor on that at the hospital if she could be operated on again. So I came with operations for my mom. But at that time, the doctor said, we have to admit it. Even doctors have our limitations. One week after that discussion, my mom passed away. You know, I don't know how many of you have life insurance. Any of you have life insurance? Yeah? Yeah. Some pay a lot to be insured. Right, for life insurance. But what does this reflect? It reflects our certainty that one day we will pass away. The life insurance does not ensure that we live forever. 
Rather, it simply ensures that you die rich, leaving money to your loved ones. Right? And that's what the next few verses tells us about the, limit, the second limitation of wealth. Wealth has to be left behind. Wealth has to be left behind. Verse 10 says, For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands for themselves. People, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like the beasts that perish. Whether we are rich or we are poor, whether we are wise, referring to obeying God, or we are foolish, referring to those who reject God, we will all die physically. Let me just clarify that verse 12 does not mean, when it says we are like the beasts that perish, it does not mean we are of the same level as the beasts in every way. We are much higher beings than the animals created in the image of God with body, soul, and spirit, which the animal does not fully have. What verse 12 is emphasizing, though, is that the body part, just as animals die, we too will all die physically. And we are reminded that when people die, they will be leaving their wealth to others. There was a billionaire who suddenly died of a heart attack. A month after the burial, the family comes together with the, um, in a meeting with the attorney and also the accountant who were helping process the inheritance. Okay. The eldest child asked the accountant, how much did father leave? They knew he had a lot of land, he had a lot of bank accounts, a lot of shares in a lot of corporations. He had so much properties, buildings under his name. And so the eldest son asked, how much did father leave? And the accountant replied, just four words, he left it all. He left it all. He left it all. That is true. Whether you have a billion pesos or you have a hundred pesos, you will have to leave them all. Even if you have a lot of lands, if you have hectares of land, even if you name a subdivision after you, even if a barangay is named after you, you will have to leave them all. Okay? Just two square meters will be enough for a burial ground. And in case your family decides to build you a grand mausoleum, you won't get to enjoy that either. It's your family that gets to enjoy that when they visit the cemetery on November 1. I was in Sanctuarium in Manila and took this photo. We rarely see this in Davao. Oh, sorry. But when you go to funeral parlors in Manila, you sometimes get to see this. Paper houses, paper cars, paper planes, paper TV, paper oven, paper microwave, paper cell phones, paper iPad. Now here we usually just see paper money in Cosmo. Right? During burial, they burn this, hoping that the, dece the deceased We'll have a house, a car, a TV, an iPad, a cell phone in the afterlife. What does this show? He couldn't bring this along. And even if we burn this, they actually won't be able to enjoy them. How far can a paper car travel? And besides, I don't think any of us want to receive a phone call from somebody who passed away already. You know, may paper cell phone siya, tatawag yan. Hello, Sherry, kumusta ka na? Miss na miss na kita. I don't want that, okay? Remember, he left it all. And I think there are two reminders for us as we think about having to leave all our wealth behind. First reminder is, we cannot bring treasures with us but we can send them ahead of us. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6.19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. We have to use our wealth for things of eternal value. We use our wealth now to support ministries that reach people with their saving gospel of Jesus Christ. We use our wealth now to disciple people 
for Jesus. We use our wealth now to help others and to bless the poor so that they see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Francis of Assisi reminds us, remember that when you leave this earth, you can take with you nothing that have, you have received, only what you have given. A second reminder is this, don't just leave your family wealth, leave them the Christian faith. Warren Wearsby rightly says, it's good to have things that money can buy if you don't lose the things money can't buy. It's sad when people start to confuse prices with values. And this mindset is something we need to pass on to our next generation. Many business people like to make sure they leave enough for their next generation. Sometimes they even leave enough for their third and fourth generation. This is good, especially if the next generation lives in harmony and uses the wealth well. Sometimes, however, the wealth becomes a cause of conflict. Now, this is, this bank account should be mine. I'm the eldest in the family. Or this family business should be mine. I made it grow. Or this house and lot should be mine. I was the one who took care of Papa for the last 20 years. You know, I urge you, don't just leave money to your children. Leave the Christian faith. Tell them what Jesus means to you. Teach them what it is to trust God rather than trust wealth. And show them that loving one another is more important than having more money than each other. It's good to leave things that money can buy, yes, but it's more important to leave things that money cannot buy. Third limitation of wealth, wealth cannot determine our eternal destiny. Wealth cannot determine our eternal destiny. Verse 13, this is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Verses 13 to 15 remind us that our wealth will not determine our eternal destiny. Just because you have mansions here does not mean you will have mansions in heaven. Just because you are always the guest of honor here does not mean you will get God's welcome, my good and faithful servant, when you get to judgment day. Observe verses 13 to 15 again. It describes two groups of people. The first is the wealthy who trust in themselves, their destiny, death, and decay in the grave. The second group is the upright. Their destiny, verse 14, the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Let me say that again. The upright will prevail over them in the morning. I love this phrase. The upright will prevail over them in the morning. You know, the morning refers to the afterlife, what comes after we die physically, and the assurance is the upright will prevail over them, the wicked, in the morning. Yes, the people who get rich from dishonesty may get a better treatment while on earth. They may get more praises and more influence. They'll have bigger houses and newer cars. They'll have complete gadgets and abundant food supply. The upright may or may not have these privileges. And it sometimes feels discouraging to obey God when we look at the dishonest prosper so much. But remember, the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Who is the upright? People who trust and follow God. And uprightness starts with receiving the ransom God provided for our lives. Remember, money cannot redeem us from the grave. And so God provides us a redeemer, the ransom who substituted for us as payment for the penalty of sin, which is death or eternal separation from God. I'm sure you're familiar with this verse. I also like to use this verse a lot. 
John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, shall not perish like the wicked will do, but have eternal life. Our uprightness starts here by believing in Jesus. We believe that Jesus died for our sins and that His death is enough to ransom our lives. And we believe that Jesus rose again from the dead and His life gives us eternal life. That's uprightness. Believing in Jesus. And then after we believe in Jesus, uprightness is living the new life Jesus gives us by turning away from sin and living in a way that's pleasing to God. Allowing Jesus to live His life in us. That includes being honest even when others are not. That includes being content even when we see the wicked prosper. That includes using our worldly wealth for eternal purposes. And that includes choosing to be spiritually rich more than being materially rich. If you have, chosen, if you have never chosen to follow Jesus, now is the time to do so. Ask Him to forgive your sins of pride, of greed, of trusting yourselves and your riches, and of all that is displeasing to God. And then ask Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord and Master. You can just tell Him, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Be my Savior. And be my Lord and Master. And then surrender your life to Him. Remember, your wealth will not determine your eternal destiny. And money cannot stop you from dying. Okay. How should we then respond when we see all these limitations of wealth? We come to the last part of Psalm 49. How can we respond when we see the wicked people getting rich? Verse 16 tells us how. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increase. The word translated overawed or amazed may also be translated afraid or dismayed based on the original Hebrew. Okay. So we'll get three translations here. ESV translates it as be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. And LT translates it, so don't be dismayed when the wicked grow rich and their homes become even more splendid. Or NIV, do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases. I'm not sure which is the precise translation for this context, but I guess all three may be good reminders. What is our usual reaction when we see the wicked prosper? Afraid? Dismayed? Overawed. Right? We may be afraid. This dishonest boss is threatening to give me a bad review if I don't give in to his sinful demands. We do not need to fear because their wealth and their power is temporary and the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Sometimes we may be dismayed. Hi, I work so hard and honestly, and this dishonest competitor just bribes the purchaser. And so even if I have the better and the cheaper product and service, I lose the sale. We do not need to be dismayed because their wealth and their power is temporary and the upright shall prevail over them in the morning. We may even be overawed or be amazed of how rich and powerful the wicked are. We may even be tempted to follow their paths of sin just so we also get more wealth, more prestige, more power. Do not be overawed because their wealth and their power is temporary and the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Why should we not be afraid or dismayed or overawed when we see the wicked grow rich? Because wealth is limited. There is limitation to wealth. Verses 17 to 20 tells us why. And I think it serves as essentially a review of what we already said. Verse 17, For they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them. Meaning, wealth has to be 
left behind. Verse 18, Though while they live, they count themselves blessed, and people praise you when you prosper. They will join those who have gone before them who will never again see the light of life. Meaning, wealth cannot stop one from dying. And verse 20, People who have wealth but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. Meaning, wealth cannot determine our eternal destiny. By the way, verse 20 expounds on verse 12 to include the condition, but lack understanding, referring to those who do not follow God as people who will perish. Perish? Sounds familiar? The term perish? Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Those who lack understanding, those who do not follow God shall perish. But those who follow Jesus and who believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord will have eternal life as their destiny. You probably have joined a party or played or observed the pinaka game. You're familiar with the pinaka game? Uh, how many of you have played this game before or watched this game? Right? The game master calls out a superlative adjective. Example, pinaka mahaba or the longest. Now, each group anticipates the description. Example, they think, they guess it's pinaka mahabang buhok. And you send somebody with very long hair to compete with the, competi uh, the contestants of the other groups. However, however, you actually know what you're competing for only after you send a representative and the game master announce, the winner is yung pinaka mahabang tenga. Okay, the longest ear. Right? Or the game master announces, okay, send your contestants for pinaka flat. And you start guessing, pinaka flat, pinaka flat, um, pinaka flat stomach. Okay? And so you send the thinnest person to the contest. Okay? But then after everybody is there for the contest, the game master announces, the winner is yung pinaka flat ang ilong. Okay? You realize you may be competing for the wrong things. Many people live life playing the pinaka game. They think the contest is pinaka marami. Has the most, and they think it's pinaka maraming pera, or pinaka maraming properties, or pinaka maraming lupa, or pinaka maraming kotse, or pinaka maraming girlfriends, or pinaka maraming kayamanan. You know, they think the contest is he who has the most wealth. And so they spend their lives busy accumulating wealth, sometimes by hook or by crook. But when we are done at the end of life, when we go to Judgment Day, our Master, He has already informed us, the contest will not be, Sino yung pinakamaraming kayamanan sa lupa? Who will ha who, who, the winner is, He will not announce that the winner is He who is wealthiest financially. What will the contest be at the end during Judgment Day? It is He who has the most treasures in heaven. It's not a competition between who is financially rich. It will be a competition, in a sense, of who is spiritually rich. Our worldly wealth will not matter on Judgment Day. It's how we use our worldly wealth now. It's our relationship with the Lord now, that will be of importance during Judgment Day. Please don't live your life competing and chasing after the wrong things. There are limitations to wealth. If you are wealthy, thank God He has blessed you with wealth and use this for eternal purposes. But if you are not wealthy, do not be overawed with the rich. Do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. Because God assures us, the righteous, the upright, will prevail over them in the morning. May we live our lives chasing after what is eternal. God bless you. Shall we pray?
I'll give you some time to pray and then let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you. Despite sometimes we cannot understand why the wicked prosper, we are assured of your word. The upright will prevail over them in the morning. Help us use our lives, help us use our wealth, help us use our time wisely and for eternal purposes. For your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us respond to this morning's message with a song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. pray for our nations let's just have uh, just one reminder let us do, do, uh, not forget to always wear our mask wash our hands and watch our distance now let us um, focus on the screen and let's pray for the nations
Let us now um, stand for the benediction. Let us pray. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, with everything good that you may do his will for eternity, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The Lord bless you, and may each one of us, uh, as we live in the present, continue to live for what is eternally valuable and what matters in eternity. The Lord bless you. <laughs>